long. So, um, disclosures, my book royalties for fat grafting. So we're talking about, the, talk about fat from the good, the bad, and the ugly. First, I think that if you look at the lady on the left, you really can see that it's unmistakable that there's volume loss, and that's so important. Um, I think that there are so many modalities of treating aging, but I think this is one of those modalities that's here to stay if you really understand that volume loss is a central tenet to the aging process. And I really believe that, just like in the last photo, that there is a role for fat grafting uh, over conventional injectable fillers when someone has enough aging that it's, it's meritorious to, to use it as actually more cost effective. So when I have someone needing, you know, on the order of 20 syringes of fillers, I usually encourage them to consider moving toward fat. Um, fat also is more predictable in that, in that ar in arena. And the reason for that is that I think that when someone comes in and they just want a little tear trough done, I rather use a, an off the shelf filler because it's much more predictable for a small area. But when, when they have pan facial volume loss, I really f believe that fat grafting may have some small areas of unpredictability. In other words, it may not a have 100% take, but it's so globally good that it's, it, it's worth it to, to consider fat grafting for more global loss. So typically what I find is someone that's over uh, 40 beyond, fat grafting is really good, or if there's a little bit more advanced aging even before 40, I, I consider fat grafting as well. The um, permanence is my own mom at 68 versus 72. I really think it holds well. Yes, there's further aging. She's aged over that period of time. I take sequential photographs. And a lady that started younger, I only put in about 16, 17 cc's, very, very little at 37. She's now uh, 42, and you can see that it's held up pretty well. And she's actually done very little vaginal toxin or other modalities other than this. And I think it's held up really well. Interestingly enough, she's an identical twin. And looking at those photos further on, you can really see a separation between the two, even though both of them have, have aged. So I try to use a language that I can communicate with patients about permanence, because it's something that is so important that if you set up those expectations appropriately. So what I usually say is that when you ask women when they thought they looked the best, it oftentimes isn't necessarily 18 or 20, when the face is very, very round and full, almost too full because of what we call baby fat. But I don't think baby fat is anything unique. All it is is just a linear loss of fat from excess to hollowness of death, minus obviously some weight gain that can occur you know, later in life. So you go to an ideal, and then you get older and older, and you constantly just lose water in the glass, so to speak. And so fat grafting durably fills that glass of water up, but it doesn't stop the aging process. You just continue to slowly, slowly lose it. You heard from Dr. McCullough that a facelift is permanent. It is, but you continue to age. So I like to use that analogy to help people understand. You know, When someone's five years out from fat grafting and say it didn't last, no, you've aged. But when the graft is there, you know, you've heard me talk in the past about how fat grafting is, in my opinion, very analogous to a hair transplant. Once the graft has blood supply and takes, just like a skin graft, how is it going to disappear at two years? How is it going to disappear at a year and a half? It's illogical. It doesn't make sense. And I do a lot of lip corrections. And I, I cut into lips that have had fat grafting, you know, 10 years ago. And I see the fat. It's globules of fat. So I can tell you that it's not scar tissue, it's viable fat that's there. And we'll talk a little bit about on the bad side to understand why fat may be bad as well if not done well or if some safety constraints are not considered. So stem cells, we heard a little about stem cells. As you heard some great talks about the dipocytes contain over 20% of stem cells. Is there an effect? I think the jury's still out. You know, I, I think that uh, this is a, a case where she really didn't do any skin therapies, this is two years out and she just looks a lot better. Is, and is this something consistent? What I try to do with my patients is truly not use the marketing hype and try to undersell them what stem cells may or may not do. I think part of what's going on is the way that light bounces off a face that has fewer transitions and fewer shadows is just more attractive. So I think sometimes you can even get some of those effects with off-the-shelf fillers. Um, maybe there's some collagen growth. I don't know how much stem cell is accountable for this. Some of the, the, the great thinkers in the world of, of fat grafting, you hear two sides of the, of the same thing from Coleman saying that it's the, it is definitely present to Lambro saying there's absolutely bunk. I'm sort of in between. I think there's definitely probably some kind of role with stem cells, but it's, I don't think it's as uh, consistent as we would all like it to be the bad. So what are the things that we have to be cautious with in terms of uh, fat grafting? 
Well, one is downtime. Clearly, that's something you need to express to patients. I think that's pretty intuitive, but over time, I think it gives a much more global effect on the face. Um, and again, this is not uh, anything else other than uh, some Botox and a fat transfer, and I think there's some, some effect on the skin that may be from the toxin and maybe from the fat. It's unclear. But I think that you need to express downtime. So with fillers, I also look at it this way because, again, it's all about patient communication. If the patient's coming in for 10, 10 sessions of fillers, they're going to have many downtimes 10 times over, just not one larger one. So I think that needs to be communicated on the front end. What else is quote unquote bad? Well, it's not bad, just a limitation. It's not going to address the neck. I think this stuff you hear online about, or you, you hear on the news about uh, uh, the liquid facelift lifting all these tissues, I really try to make the distinction for my patient between a fill and a lift. I really don't think when you fill something, something will be lifted. I think when you lift something, it's not going to be filled. But these are two distinct entities that you have to keep in the, in that verbiage clean in the mind of the, the consumer or in, in your patient. And so I don't do brow lifts anymore. I really believe that even this brow that looks like it probably would benefit from lifting, I just filled it in. And sometimes a fuller brow is, to me, more attractive. But I really believe that necks still need to be lifted when there's an indication for that. I don't think a, a fat graft will be able to, to manage that. And occasionally I still do blepharoplasties. It's, it's much less likely than I did in the past, or much less of an occurrence I did in the past. But I still believe there's if there's too much steatoblepharon in the lower eyelids, if there's too much dermatochalasis on the upper eyelid, I believe that combining those with a fat transfer can yield a very, very good natural result. But again, in my opinion, I rarely do a brow lift. Last one I did was about four years ago for a congenitally totic brow that was just really, really low. But really rare that I consider a brow lift necessary in, in t uh, today. And as I said, I, th I don't think fat grafting is 100% predictable. It's just not in anyone's hands. But I think that if you do consistent work and you, you deliver it, you get very good results overall. And I still use fillers at a year, and I tell my patients on the front end, you may need a syringe or two of fillers to compensate and make small little adjustments for fat. Because otherwise, you risk overfilling someone. You constantly try to fill with, with fat, and then you can actually have an overfilled face. But it, it, the difference is what I tell my patients. In seven, instead of needing 8 to 15 syringes, I just need probably one or two. And that's oftentimes what I do to maintain them afterwards, is that once a year to once every, every other year, instead of doing a fat graft, I may do a little filler for them just to maintain their aging. To me, this is a good balance in understanding and using the armamentarium you have available. I don't believe fat grafting is as reliable for lips and causes more edema and prolonged edema with more resorption. As you know, that patient satisfaction on the front end is something that is so important. If you put them through a protracted recovery and then under deliver areas, there is going to be a risk. So I tend to use fillers for lips. The ugly. What are things that look bad? Well, is this good? Really overfilling a face. You see these things now. You, you, we used to see all these really overlifted faces. Now we see these really overfilled faces. And is that attractive? And I would argue no. This is a case that I believe she still looks better afterwards, but it's slightly full. She had gained about 25 pounds afterwards. And I still use this photo you know, as, a, as a good example of a result. But she's slightly on the fuller side for my taste. Um, you know, so that's something that you have to caution patients. In fact, when I articulate the risk to a patient in the preoperative setting, I underscore the number one risk is not lumps and bumps, not if you do good technique. It's not that it goes away, but it truly is the opposite, which is substantive weight gain on the order, in my opinion, of 20 pounds or, or more. You can take risk with this. Fortunately, what I've seen is that patients have lost the weight subsequent to the weight gain, have returned themselves. A good example is my own mother. She had gained about 20 pounds after the fat graft and looked quite full. And that was about year 1.5. She lost the weight and even lost more fat, uh, excuse me, more weight than her preoperative setting and still maintain it because the fat, I think, has the nature of fat from the belly or thighs where you're harvesting it, which is that it's very durable and has a little bit more tendency toward preservation when you lose weight, but has a greater risk when you gain weight. So something that I think is really important that this is not just a filler, off-the-shelf filler, but it is weight dependent. And it's one of those things that I think in the preoperative setting you must underscore to a patient who's considering this. This is why, in my opinion, I tend not to do 
fat, uh, fat transfers in highly unstable weight patients or people that are very young, such as in their 20s. I was lecturing in 2007 in Columbia, and I, I mentioned this, and I mentioned being careful to use it in asymmetric uh, settings, such as a mandibular loss or something like that. And uh, the gentleman that was lecturing right uh, after me said, I wish I had known that because this 18-year-old that he overstuffed a mandible after three years, it started to get larger um, as she gained weight. And so this is something that is highly unstable when you're dealing with someone very young and you're using it to, as a filler. I think you have to be cautious and respect it as a graft because that's really what it is. So you see these things where overfilled faces, and I think that, I really think that this is a, a universal aesthetic that you have to apply not only to fat, but also fillers. Just filling the cheek is a mistake, in my opinion. Now, if they have very early aging and that's all they can afford is maybe one syringe of a filler or something, yeah, the cheek is actually a, a, a great home run region. But when you start to fill and fill and fill, what I always try to advocate is looking at the face in total. What's interesting, what I, a patient brought this photo in and said, look at this, this is terrible, I don't want this in, in a fat graft. And, and I thought one thing that was interesting when I looked at this, I don't know if you guys can do this, is sort of take your hands and cover like the mouth area and just look at the cheek in isolation. It doesn't look as bad because the cheek is actually rejuvenated, but it's just way too big relative to the lower face. It's way too big relative to the brow. The brow, you know, it's very hard to remove fat. But in a way, the way that I would manage this, I probably would use some fillers and fill in the brow, fill in the lower face, and it will actually take the cheek and blend it back into the face so that it doesn't just stand out like a sore thumb. So this is the, the idea that the, the ugly to me is not just overfilling, it's unbalanced, where people just say, well, hey, I've always heard that filling in the cheek is a good thing, so let me just blow that up. Um, and to me, what's really, really nice and something that I, I believe I've contributed in the thinking process is understanding the buccal area, understanding the cheek in multidimensional areas. For example, anterior cheek, lateral cheek, the central buccal zone, the area that arches underneath the zygoma. All these little areas, if you start to see this, you can be creative not only with fat but with fillers and be able to blend areas, temples, anterior chins, all these little components, when you blend it all in, you don't have this over-articulated cheek, but everything works in unison and there's, there's artistry, balance, and restraint. So, thank you for your attention.